will be a series of BCIS webinars aimed at giving practical advice and insight into the industry. BCIS is now unbelievably in its 60th year. Um, I haven't been around for, for all of those uh, 60 years, of course. Um, uh, uh, you'll be seeing some really exciting changes and developments to BCIS over the forthcoming months and years. Uh, the first of which is an upgraded online platform that is not only easier to use and access data, but we've also rewritten the back end to allow us to do some of the exciting things we have planned, all of which are designed to give better data, insight or digital data exchange. So please stay, stay tuned for some of those announcements. I'm also delighted to say that this episode we are delivering in association with Causeway, who we've been working with very closely over recent months to get the BCIS data flowing mm. throughout their solutions. Causeway offers solutions across the whole construction lifecycle, and if you have a BCIS subscription, you don't need to pay any more money to access the data through these products. There's obviously a lot more details uh, available on the, on the Causeway website. But today isn't about trying to sell you things, it's about sharing insight and trying to support each other. We are obviously living in a very unique time, uh, times that are making any prediction of construction costs incredibly tricky. So today we wanted to bring together some experts to give their view of the world and what they are doing to predict construction costs. But before we get started, just a few bits of housekeeping for me. Um, please feel free to ask any questions throughout the webinar using, using the chat box. With such a large group and, and a short duration, we won't be able to open the floor for, for questions and answers. So please post, post your questions and then I'll deliver some of those questions to the, to the panel later on in this session. For those questions that we don't get around to airing during this uh, short session, we'll be continuing this, the discussion using the BCIS LinkedIn group, the address of which is, uh, it, well, you can find it via searching on uh, on LinkedIn for, for, for the BCIS. Um, uh, so uh, the session today will be recorded and made available on that same LinkedIn group. So in case you encounter any technology problems, and of course we all know they, they happen quite a bit, um, don't worry, you'll still get a chance to watch and interact with the speakers and the BCIS specialists after this live event. And finally, when leaving the session today, you're going to be prompted uh, to give feedback on this event. The feedback will help us make sure we're delivering what you want in the future. So please do take the time out to, to answer those. And also, if you have any topics that you'd like us to, to focus on for future events, please let us know in that feedback form. So in today's session, we'll be hearing from our very own David Crosswaite, who heads up the BCIS consultancy uh, team. He'll be highlighting the current economic challenges and the BCIS view of what is happening with tender prices. We'll then be hearing from Alan Muse, who is our global director of built environment at RICS, who will be talking to us about the new RICS cost prediction statement and how that can help predict costs in these very volatile times. And last, but certainly not least, very pleased to, to announce that we're also joined today by Mark Williams, who's the Head of Technical Services and Research at MACE, who as a consultancy practice and a contractor, MACE have a very unique view of the world right now. So I'm delighted that Mark will be joining um, us to talk through what MACE are doing with regard to cost prediction on construction projects. So quite a packed agenda, short time scale. So without any delay, further delay, let's hand over to David for the BCIS view of the economy and the tender climate. Over to you, David, please. Thank you, James, um, very much. Um, we've got a few slides to go through. Um, and we, we thought given the current unprecedented circumstances that, that we find ourselves in, um, it would be useful to write a sort of an outlook for, for the construction sector over, over the next few years. So in the next few, few slides, we're going to examine um, both historical data, um, we're going to give you some predictions, um, and we'll start by looking at the prospects for the whole economy, um, to set some context, as obviously construction sits within uh, the whole economy of the UK. Um, and then we'll, we'll look at the specific impacts of, of COVID and Brexit on, on the construction sector. Um, it's, worth, it's worth noting here that we're, we're using the latest available data to, to provide our, um, our analysis. Um, and 
Manas Lake is available in terms of official data that's uh, up until the 31st of December of last year. Um, and obviously we're using some forecasts that are BCIS uh, specific, so a combination of official data and BCIS data. Um, if we can go on to the first slide, please, Richard. Um, hopefully you can all see that. Um, it, it's a view of GDP over the last 300 years, um, and it, it's official. Uh, last year, GDP declined by the largest single amount for, for 300 years. Um, this chart shows GDP in real terms, which is the green line, and year-on-year -year changes, which is the red line, um, going back to 1700. Um, and it has major points in history highlighted. Uh, and what we can see is that we're in largely uncharted territory compared to the recent past. Last year, GDP fell by over 10% the largest contraction since the Great Frost of 1709, when the UK's agriculture-based economy was laid waste by three months of sub-zero temperatures. That was the time when um, many, many farmers were, were seriously struggling and uh, poorer people in the country were dying from the cold, while the richer people were burning their furniture to, to, to keep warm. Um, so we're going a long way back uh, for something that, that, that matches the current uh, state we're in. Um, the 2020 fall in, 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 in GDP is of a similar magnitude to that seen um, during the First World War and the Spanish flu pandemic, um, but it exceeds other shocks experienced over the last 300 years, including the Second World War and the Great Depression, which I think makes it a major point in history. Um, while not wanting to paint a too depressing picture, um, which is it's quite difficult not to given, given the data we're seeing, um, it's worth noting the data presented here is, is from before the latest lockdown started. Uh, so the position could actually be compounded. Um, so that's our look at history. Um, if we move to the next slide now, we can, we can have a brief look into the future. Um, and as noted, um, I think the latest lockdown uh, starting on January the 4th is almost certain to have pushed uh, the UK economy into another recession. Um, and we've got a sort of almost perfect storm um, of COVID and Brexit impacts coinciding um, in the first quarter of 2021. Um, we've got GDP predicted to fall by a further 5% in, in the first quarter. Um, but, but looking at the chart, um, current forecasts are suggesting um, that a W-shaped recession is likely. And I think midway through last year, um, for, for most economists, that was the, 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 the broad prediction. Um, and a lot of this is going to be dependent on the progression of the pandemic. Um, but uh, yeah, at the moment, a W-shaped recession is, is probably uh, most likely. Although I don't think we can rule out the prospect of the recession being L-shaped. Um, and that's probably the worst case scenario. Um, and that will largely be the result of, uh, of the economy stag stagnating um, if, if the pandemic remains. Um, and you've only got to look at Japan in the 1990s to see um, the impact of an L-shaped recession. It was almost a decade of stagnation for the Japanese economy. So that's probably the worst case scenario. But there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, the vaccine rollout, obviously, in the UK has been very successful. Um, so we're, we're, we're hoping um, for, for some good news going forward in terms of the wider economy. Um, if we now look at the construction economy, so next slide. Um, when I was doing this analysis, I was actually very surprised um, at, at total construction output. Given that um, construction remained largely operational th throughout last year, um, there was a 12.5% decline in sector output th through, through 2020, which made it the worst performing of the four main subsectors across the whole economy. Um, I was very surprised by that. Um, but uh, this is according to the latest data, which was issued last, fr last Friday. Um, so it has been dramatic, the impact on construction. Um, so this chart doesn't look at total output. It looks at output broken down by the main two main sectors of construction output which is new work 
uh, and repair and maintenance. And it looks looks over a period to 1997. Um, and yeah, as you can see, the newer sector is, is, is far larger than the repair and maintenance sector. Um, and therefore probably more important um, for construction as a whole. Um, and the decline in output is much more pronounced in new work. Um, and this is largely because the sector is more volatile than repair and maintenance due to the link, uh, direct link to, to levels of investment. Um, at the trough in the mid mid 2020s, new work was back to levels last seen in 1997. Um, there was a 35% drop in output recorded. However, there is a strong bounce back evident in the data, um, the latest set of data. Um, and although the caveat remains that this is the pre latest lockdown, so th th there is likely to be an impact um, in Q1 2021 going forward. Um, next slide, please, Richard. So, given that new, the new work sector is, is, is the largest, um, uh, we've taken a look at the different parts of um, the new work output. Um, and to the left of the vertical line are our actuals, and to the right are the BCIS forecasts for output over the next five years. Um, and what's evident from, from this chart is that commercial work, which is the orange line, has seen the largest decline in output over the period. Um, and our predictions are that that will continue through to 2025, um, as I think we're all seeing the requirements for space are changing fundamentally. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom. Um, the infrastructure, infrastructure output, which is the green line, um, has grown over the period, and we forecast that that will continue strongly through to 2025 as the sector is likely to be used to stimulate the wider um, uh, recovery in the wider economy. Um, and we also predict that despite a slowdown, private housing, which is the red line, will rebound strongly through the period. Um, the other subsectors uh, are obviously slightly smaller. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, please, Richard. Um, so this slide is looking at building costs and, and, and tender prices. Um, and as you'd expect, there have been some impacts on input costs um, and, and, and tender prices. Um, again, to the left of the vertical line are our actuals and to the right are our forecasts, the BCIS forecast over the next five years. Um, as you'd expect, costs and prices are both declining um, through 2020. But going forward, we predict costs will increase um, through, through 2021, while prices continue to decline. We expect prices to pick up again through 2022 as the recovery takes hold. Um, I think this picture in this chart is, is slightly misleading. It appears that any change on cost and prices is relatively benign. Um, I suspect that the full picture is not really evident in the data yet due to the lag in, in collection and production. Um, certainly my suspicion is based on, on the previous data presented in the chart is that we can expect to see declines in prices, at least similar to those witnessed during the last financial crisis um, just over 10 years ago. So I, I suspect there's some way to go in terms of um, what our price and cost predictions look like going forward. Um, if we go on to the next slide, please Richard. Um, we, BCIS, um, have, a, have an industry panel. We set up an industry panel to to give us some sort of on the ground and on the ground view of, of uh, what's happening in construction. This has proved to be really important um, over the last year. Um, as I've touched on, there is an inherent data lag in, in producing statistics of all, of all types. Um, so you end up with, you're reporting, you're reporting on data and trying to um, summarize that data and provide analysis um, that's the data is historic um, and in fast moving situations you want something that's a little a little bit more um, on, on time and, and sort of giving you a view of what's happening within a month rather than the last three months. So I'm not going to go through these um, points individually um, because unfortunately we, I'm running up against the clock at the moment. Um, but suffice to say that the overview is that um, Contractors are pretty busy um, through this year, but they're obviously getting very nervous about 2022 and 2023. 
um, and looking looking for work to secure their order books and obviously keep keep their guys on site going forward. Um, the other thing that industry practitioners have noticed is that there's increasing competition for all project sizes, um, and that's likely to lead to some pressure on prices going forward. Uh, next slide, please, Richard. Um, the other major issue, and this is likely to have had a massive impact on output, is, is productivity on site. Um, now, I think the general consensus is that currently it's around 80% of, of, of pre-pandemic levels. Um, and that's clearly, in terms of output per work, you're going to have an impact on, on output. So while there is some sort of upbeat talk about productivity um, getting close to levels pre-pandemic, I, th I think um, the metric use is currently that uh, productivity is about 80% of, of pre-COVID levels. So there's, there's some ground to make up, and I'm assuming once we once we go through this latest lockdown um, and the vaccine's taken effect, then hopefully we'll we'll be in a better place. And there are also some worrying trends evident from, from last year in terms of supply, the supply side of the industry. Um, Labour force fell by 140,000 in, in last year, which is almost 10% of the total. There's still disruption to its material supply um, following uh, manufacturing plants being closed down. And that combined with some, some of the Brexit issues um, on the border um, has, has, caused, has caused supply issues with bricks and plasterboard and some timber products as well. Um, so that low availability of labour and <coughs> potential um, supply issues is likely to cause problems, likely to rise costs in the short term and, and probably lower prices. Um, move on to the next slide, please, Richard. So our uh, look at market conditions. So what does the future look like in terms of construction demand? Um, uh, this slide shows both the BCIS market factor, which is a relationship between costs and prices, um, and the correlation between new work output and new orders. Um, and we're using both of those to predict future demand conditions. I mean, it's fair to say that our market conditions factor is starting to turn down, and we expect that to continue through through 2021 as the pandemic drags on and the government-sponsored uh, business support schemes and the furlough schemes unwind. Um, probably more concerning is the uh, new orders data, um, which indicates a 45% decline year on year. And that's the largest change for over three decades, which suggests that establishing future pipelines is likely to become more challenging as quick as we go forward through this year. Uh, next slide, please, Richard. So in, in, in summary, um, what's our view? Well, the impact on construction has been dramatic um, relative, relative to other subsectors, as we've just seen in the, in the data presented. Um, our view is that the levels of investment are likely to remain constrained um, in the immediate future, given, given the uncertainty surrounding what the new normal is going to look like. Um, and there are also some fundamental market shifts appearing. Um, Clearly, the need for office space is, is being uh, drawn into question um, with the continuation of remote working. Um, there's likely to be a move from urban residential to rural residential. Um, and also, we've got the demise of, of, of high street retail. All of these things, or two, certainly two of those bullet points, are going to feed into, uh, com into the commercial sector. Uh, there is some prospect of, of, of hope. Um, the recovery could be driven by, by the government using construction spending to, to, to stimulate the wider economy. Um, and I, I suspect that that's going to be, there'll be some announcements, I would imagine, in the budget in March. Um, clearly, we've got historically low interest rates, um, which, which should spur investment and lead us through some of the darker times of, of this year. Um, the, there are supply constraints that we've seen uh, of both labour and materials. Um, and that combined with increased competition is likely to lead to cost and price pressures. Our view is that costs will, will likely increase in the short term while prices decrease, leading to reduced margins and prelims for contractors. So that's uh, hopefully not too, uh, too uh, uh, dispiriting picture. But uh, next, uh, Alan's, uh, Alan Muse uh, will introduce the new RICS professional statement 
on cost prediction and hopefully provide some practical advice, advice on how we can get through this. Thank you very much, Over David. You Thank you. Um, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. I do want to talk to you today about the new RICS professional statement in cost prediction, which has a global application. Um, and I think cost benchmarking, early cost advice, cost estimating, cost planning are, of course, essential skills in the financial management of construction and infrastructure projects. And, and I think across different markets and sectors, public and private clients are unified in needing this timely and realistic advice for investment decisions. And set against David's um, landscape of the construction market, I think in these post-COVID times or, be, or potentially post-COVID times, these decisions are proving increasingly difficult and therefore better and more accurate cost prediction will lead to more investment in construction. And this skill is not just limited to consultant advice, it encompasses contractors and the supply chain in bidding for work and clients in framing their business cases. So I'm talking today about quantity surveyors operating with client organizations, with consultants and with contractors. And of course, it's not just limited to capital costs either, because increasingly, increasingly funders, financiers and investors in terms of over 500 ESG funds founded last year need cost prediction to cover life cycle costs and particularly as asset life and maintenance and sustainability calculations become more critical. And professionals with clients, consultants and contractors in specific market sectors, where historical data is plentiful, shared and the supply chain well experienced, do already produce reliable cost estimates. In fact, the work of cost managers often entails delivering the project within a well accepted and robust cost envelope i.e. the client knows what the cost of the scheme will be. But this work is more about integration and alignment of all the stakeholders to a common financial goal rather than advice on cost prediction. However, larger, more complex projects, bespoke projects, and many infrastructure projects, in fact, are much more problematic and outturn costs often exceed their budget. And I think there's been some strong research by Professor Flint uh, Bent Fluberg at the Save Business School at Oxford University, which shows substantial cost escalation in infrastructure is actually the rule rather than the exception. For rail, the average cost escalation is 45%. For fixed links, i.e. tunnels and bridges, it is 34%. And for roads, it is 20%. And cost escalation appears to be a global phenomenon existing across 20 nations on five continents. And cost estimates have not improved and cost escalation not decreased over the past 70 years. So alongside these difficulties, technology is developing rapidly, offering new potential. If professional standards for data collection analysis can be integrated with BIM models uh, and the new digital twins concept and data lakes established to feed artificial intelligence, cost prediction can be applied to multiple build scenarios in a, in a resource efficient way. And as a global professional institution developing standards in this area, the question is obviously posed, how should the RICS respond to these challenges? And clearly there is a need to develop a framework for global best practice, which can then act as principles for differing market and sector contexts, because we are a global professional financial institution. Uh, institution. And with the publication of the second edition of ICMS um, in September, 2019, RICS has developed a professional statement in cost prediction to utilize ICMS and signpost global best practice. And, th and this will actually form part of a wider set of emerging global standards in construction covering project and cost management across buildings and infrastructure to sit above the national guidance that we already have in the UK, such as the Black Book and NRM. So today, in terms of the overview of the RICS professional global statement in cost prediction, I'll give you um, a quick run through. Next slide, please, Richard. So in, just in terms of terminology here, we use the term cost prediction because it's a global term that encompasses estimating and cost planning and benchmarking across the project life cycle for both buildings and infrastructure. Um, so that's a global term that we've decided to use for this professional statement, just to clarify that issue. Next slide, please, Richard. And just to emphasize the point that I made about 
and Professor Fluberg's research, um, there are many examples of projects around the world and particularly larger projects, which unfortunately are over budget over and over again, as he puts it. And there's just some examples listed here. So this is a real problem in practice um, that the quantity surveying profession working on these projects needs to address. Next slide, please. And as I said in my opening comments, construction is changing um, as well as greater need to bring in ESG thinking and sustainability decisions. We have emerging um, development of off-site construction and also particularly digitization, which is beginning to have an effect on the industry, both in terms of um, artificial intelligence, building information modeling and digital twins, advanced materials, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of change happening in construction, which COVID has no doubt acted as a catalyst in terms of, certainly in the UK context, reinvention. But in my conversations around the world about construction, I find this is a recurring theme. These are recurring themes in terms of um, government's efforts around the world to um, bring construction um, to, the, to the front rather than the back of developments alongside other industries. Next slide, please. And International Construction Measurement Standards, which as I said, was published in September 2019 acts as a bridge between different markets and subsectors within markets to in, and also incorporates life cycle costs and although this is a high level standard for cost reporting which doesn't necessarily which, which can link to more detailed national standards like the NRM the issue with ICMS is that acts it can act as a, a standardized benchmarking tool both it, both in terms of a data standard with new technology and in terms of connecting to design classifications, and we've already mapped it to uniclass, uh, omniclass, and some other uh, classifications around the world. So this bridge between markets and between sectors can be undertaken in capital and life cycle cost terms with ICMS. And the third edition, which will be published later this year, will also encompass carbon metrics, because as I said earlier, this is an increasing issue in terms of the decarbonisation of the industry. Next slide, please, Richard. So the aims of the professional statement are to outline the importance of the process and the skills and knowledge required by the cost management professionals involved to define clear and consistent terminology um, and, and to think of uh, cost prediction more of as a systemized process in terms of inputs and outputs. And the inputs obviously being important in terms of the information that we've got depending on the stage of the project and the sources and uses of, of the data that we're using um, and how they're transformed into an output, i.e. the cost prediction report. Um, and obviously the prediction process varies um, greatly in accuracy depending on the information upon which it's based and the stage of the project. And then also to integrate ICMS as the standard for cost classification in support of benchmarking and reliable cost prediction. So in short, we're looking to signpost global best practice in cost prediction and also integrate the use of ICMS for our ICS members. Next slide, please, Richard. And we'll all be familiar, those who work in the financial management of construction with the concept of um, a more accurate cost as we go through the project life cycle, depending on the information available. But what we decided to do in the cost prediction professional statement is be agnostic in terms of work stages, because actually work stages can be misleading in terms of the RIBA plan of work or grip in infrastructure, because they assume that all the information is available um, at the particular point that that decision is being made based on the cost estimate. So what we've decided to do is to make sure that the estimate is dependent upon the input. So level one is estimate, level two estimate is defined by the maturity of the input information. And all the maturity information needs to be of that, uh, all the information needs to be of that maturity in order to call it a level two estimate or a level three estimate. And this is quite important, I feel, in terms of the advice that's given to clients at different stages of the project. Next slide, please. 
And of course, cost prediction, we cover data in the cost prediction professional statement, and that's really what we're talking about today and the normalization analysis of that data and the output into a model. So there is a long detailed section within the cost prediction professional statement on data. Next slide, please, Richard. And of course, uncertainty and risk is key in this process as well. Uncertainty being, if you like, unknown unknowns and, and risk being the known unknowns. Um, and the cause and effect of those risks need to be understood and explained in the cost prediction output report. Next slide, please. And of course, business value um, improves as we move from just reporting and describing what the cost is and monitoring the cost to actually being predictive about the cost, which is what this professional statement is all about. But thereafter, to actually um, provide prescriptive analysis. In other words, what management action should be taken um, in, the, in the view of the predicted cost that's being given. Um, this is particularly relevant in the terms of risk um, you, we can have a we can have a table of risks and the effect of those risks, but what management action should be taken in order to obviate and manage those risks? Next slide, please. So finally, I just wanted to say that this is a professional statement, and therefore, from an RICS member and as a self-regulating professional body, um, there are certain things that we've listed from the professional statement that are actually mandatory for the profession and regulated firms. So based upon the information and briefing provided, produce a reliable cost prediction appropriate for the needs and best interests of the client, the size and complexity of the project and the project stage. Consider and agree with the client the appropriate method for reporting costs, recommending the use of ICMS where that would be in the best interest of the client and provide the source of the data on which the cost prediction is based and a commentary on the dependability of the cost data. Obviously identify the key assumptions um, and, and the timing and methodology constraints, state the change and commensurate with the size and complexity of the project provide an estimate of the accuracy or level of uncertainty of the cost prediction and how this can be improved through management action. Now, many professionals do this already. What we're saying is that we need to lift the tide for all boats here and make it a consistent um, requirement for professionals around the world um, to use um, standard cost classifications uh, and a standard process. Uh, and this will lead to um, better cost prediction in the industry. Thank you. And back to you, Mark, I believe. Thank you, Alan. Um, so starting off, I'd just like to, to have a recap of how um, COVID actually hit construction projects um, so far. We can move to the next slide, please, Richard. So site closures, um, or not, as, a, as I've written here, are very much dependent on the type of client and the type of project. Uh, for example, fit out um, projects were far more uh, affected than infrastructure projects. Um, and if, we're, if building a road, there's less social distancing to, to, to worry about. And uh, if you're in a, a fit out environment, obviously there's a lot of close contact. So um, it, it's very much been dependent on, on that. Um, <coughs> Type of client as well. It depends where the funding is coming from. Central government were obviously very keen to uh, to keep their projects running once the uh, site operating procedures were were in place and adopted. Um, but those clients that were relying on the, the general public paying admission fees, for example, like museums and things, their projects were were affected completely differently, and and some of those are still on hold. Um, and David mentioned about labour supply issues with the with the loss of 140,000 workers in, in the industry over the course of last year. Um, lockdown one really saw the main uh, issues um, because everybody was locked down. Uh, and most sites dropped from 62,000 workers to 2,000 workers in that lockdown. So that's a 90, 96% drop in people on sites. Um, since then, it's, it's largely recovered um, to, to pre-COVID levels. Um, predominantly due to the fact that the, the site operating procedures have been um, updated. We're currently on version seven of those at the moment. Um, material supplies were also affected uh, as well. And as David picked up, there were products like plasterboard and bricks, which saw some particular issues due to manufacturers taking opportunities to uh, refurbish their plants. So there was a restricted supply. 
there have also been some problems with um, materials having to come in from different places uh, because they just weren't available. So they, ha they had reduced volumes um, uh, of, of materials that were available to purchase. We've also seen some productivity drops due to the uh, site operating procedures, social distancing, um, revised methods of working, uh, additional breaks for hand washing, staggered start times, all of that actually impacts on the productivity per, per worker. Uh, and there are two ways of measuring the productivity, one of which is, is actually looking at the, the financial um, uh, productivity and the other one is actually physical productivity. I think the financial one can be skewed by the fact that clients were paying uh, potentially upfront for some works, so it, that's not a particularly uh, good metric to, to look at. But in terms of outputs, on the 80% that, um, that David mentioned earlier, we're seeing 80-85% of, of where we were pre-COVID uh, as being achievable at the moment. Because of the site operating procedures, we've obviously had some uh, additional costs which are being covered as well. So there's, there's issues like larger site setups to accommodate the additional canteen spaces, uh, social uh, distancing so that the, the guys can um, sit uh, adjacent to each other rather than face to face, enhanced cleaning, enhanced PPE, different types of logistics and deliveries, so drivers not being able to get out of their vehicles, more logistics teams required to unload uh, vehicles and such like. Personnel tracking once once the guys are on site, so that, that's quite a key now with the lateral flow testing that's been introduced to all most sites. Um, and of course, we've, we've got um, extended programmes uh, as well. Uh, and that, that sort of raises the question of that, who's liable for the costs of the site operating procedures? Well, the, the answer is it depends on contract type, whether it's a JCT or NEC. Um, I'm not a lawyer though, so I'm actually not going to go into the legalities of it. Um, there are two different types of client responses that, that we, we've noticed. So it goes from the, the client saying it's a contractor risk, you're totally responsible to those clients that are actually doing a, uh, I suppose, a pain share. Um, so they're buying, uh, if you want to call it that, the COVID risk up to a date in time, taking maybe a 50-50 uh, share of, of those costs with the contractors. So it really depends on um, the client uh, as to how that's being dealt with. The next slide, please, Richard. So, harking back to, to David's slides, this is, this is just a, a, a smaller shot of one, one of the, the graphs that David had um, in there. Um, it, it just shows from March to December. Um, I think he would probably agree with me. If you, if you actually look at, um, whether you look at wages in the construction industry, labour availability, new orders or construction output, they all follow this, this same shape. It dropped off a cliff March, April, recovered fairly strongly until everybody decided summer holidays were, were a thing they wanted to look at. Um, and then it's been recovering ever so slightly and then dipping again whilst we've gone into the sec second lockdown. Um, it's very sector specific though. And you'll notice from the graph here that infrastructure dipped just below 80% um, in April, and that's actually back, back up to pre-COVID levels. Um, whereas housing dropped down to 40% and is, is still struggling. There, there have been some, some government intervention to, to help um, some sectors, obviously large infrastructure projects, which are central government funded, they're helping that sector. Repair and maintenance surprisingly has done quite well uh, during the period, but private commercial, retail, hospitality, um, commercial offices, all of those are really struggling. But I know clients are looking to repurpose some of their properties and, and refocusing uh, their, their businesses. And you know the government have tried to help uh, the housing industry as best they can, but um, it's still not manifesting itself in a full recovery. So next slide, please, Richard. So tools, processes, and approach. Uh, having been involved with the creation of the CLC toolkit. Um, we still think this is actually a very good start point and a common uh, approach uh, that, that should be adopted. Um, it's not to say we, we use the <clears throat> documentation 100% as, as it is on the, the toolkit, but the contents of the toolkit are key. So we, we look at um, the assessment uh, of two factors. So you have productivity risk factors and you have market conditions factors. Um, they're, they're actually applied to measured works and on costs. So labour, 
is affected in terms of productivity, what's the impact of the compliance of the SOP? Can offsets um, <coughs> be uh, achieved by using pre-manufactured materials, modern methods of construction, BIM, all of those good things. They, we can actually try and offset some of those um, productivity uh, issues. Um, and market conditions factor for labour is basically, it's, it's an interesting market at the moment because with the reduced amount of labour that's around, you'd think the, the costs would be going up. The, the, the earnings per, per week dipped in exactly the same fashion as all of the, all of the other metrics um, during the period. They're pretty much back to where they were before. Um, you would expect the labour cost to be reducing due to weakening demand. So, so there's a slight dichotomy um, in, in that market. Um, but how, how do those um, metrics affect plant? In terms of uh, productivity, the only major um, issue would be around craneage and hoisting. Um, everything else you use, what you use. Market conditions wise, it's weakening demand. If there's weakening demand, that will obviously affect all the pricing. Um, and materials, uh, that, that's quite quite a key one. Um, if you if you were having offsite produced materials, um, you could expect some of those costs to increase because they're having to comply with the site operating procedures as well. Um, they, they have particular standards that they'd have to adhere to in the factories. So that's a potential um, uh, impact on that. Again, costs uh, reducing due to weakening demand. Uh, on the other side, we've got the increased cost of imports and tariffs due to declining UK pr production. Um, and obviously the, this, the disruption factor as well, which, which is um, on the supply side. Um, in terms of on costs, uh, pre prelims is effectively, it's looking at the, at the prolongation um, due to productivity. Um, you know, we could be looking at loss of productivity, more head, ca head count because you're having to get more people to do the same work because they can't do it more uh, as efficiently. Um, increased cost of supervision due to the, the uh, SOP, um, all, all of those things uh, need to be taken into account. Um, market conditions, effectively, we, we could be seeing a scenario where overhead and profit increases due to reduced uh, production. Um, and on the flip side of that, as, as David uh, pointed out anecdotally, Contractors are looking uh, at some of the projects that they've already signed up to with a view that taking a view on that. So um, I think most of these, there's, there's, there's two sides to, uh, to, the, to the same story on here. So the qualification statement that we came up with for the CLC toolkit is on the slide here. I'm not going to read through it, but it's basically, it's just trying to explain to uh, the, the client how you've approached um, COVID and whether, whether the specific uh, allowances have or have not been made. Uh, so it's actually done with, with a professional view uh, as to how we've arrived at, at the, the report that, we've, uh, that we're issuing. So the risk assessment provides a clear means of communicating the elements of the COVID risk that are included or excluded. So it's, it's key to note, you just don't do one or the other, it's, it's both, you need to explain what is included and excluded. So you can see what, what's in there. It's measured works on cost, market conditions, further disruption that may, that may be there, what the estimate's based on, and any potential mitigation measures that you've included in, in your pricing. The next slide, please, Richard. So moving on to benchmarking in COVID, um, <clears throat> the current IRIS's guidance states that as part of benchmarking analysis process, it's worth checking that references made to market conditions, supply chain interrogation, form of contract, procurement route, and risk transfer issues. Now, all of these are impacted by COVID. So what we need to understand is how each product, uh, sorry, project has been affected. So there are four scenarios for this. It's projects that um, happened and completed before COVID. Projects that have been affected by COVID during the pre-construction phase, so when we're designing cost planning. Um, projects affected by COVID during the construction phase, which do, don't have a contract with express provision um, for the pandemic. And those projects which have started in, in COVID with provisions uh, ex expressly included in the contract. Now they tend to fall into, th into three heads. So it's either you're entitled to an extension of time, an extension of time with all loss and or expense, 
or extension of time plus a predetermined percentage of the, of the loss and or expense, which would be agreed between both parties. In order for us to be able to benchmark, uh, we need to understand what level of provision and recovery is contained within the costs that, we, that we've managed to um, obtain so that we can segregate and analyse those separately from the core construction costs. It's not to say that we're going to exclude them or include them. It depends on what we want to be doing with our benchmark. Next slide, please, Richard. <coughs> so at MACE, we have a, a, a mandated data capture pro uh, process, which we refer to as project feedback. It requires data from each project to be captured at defined stages and using re regionalized schemas. The data captured in each region uses a predefined set of requirements, which is common to all regions. Responsibilities for, for the data validation sits with the key stakeholder in each region, who sits as part of a single team who validate all data that we receive. Picking up on James's point, um, we've been working with Causeway as well over the course of the last um, year. Uh, we, we have them as our software partner. We've been developing out with them one of the modules in the Cato suite. It's the Quickest module. This now feeds the data that we capture on our feedback forms into our um, web portal, which we, we've had built for us. The Cato suite also has a link into BCS, which, which ensures that we can actually use the current um, data and indices to bring the, all of the data to a common point and the required location um, when we're doing our benchmarking. So on the next slide, it's an example of the <coughs> forms that, that we, we used and, and now use. Um, what, we, what we haven't tried to do straight away is reinvent the wheel um, or, or to try to change the way our, our teams report on their projects because changing it from something that they've been using for certainly the whole time I've been at Mason in the last 15 years uh, to something completely new in one go, we, we felt that was a step too far. So, so what we've done with Causeway is developed a data import form which pulls the information directly from our feedback forms. Once one of my colleagues who knows how to write macros and clever things like that um, has worked his magic on it, so we can just import the data directly into, into the system. The reasoning behind that is what, like everybody else, we, we like to move away from Excel. We recognize the fact that there are all those occasions where it's really quite useful. Um, so what, what we're actually doing is keeping the existing processes running in parallel with the new one uh, for the time being. So we're actually using the same data in two different ways. What we have done as part of this process, though, is to enrich the data that we capture. We're now looking to uh, capture more data, which is common across all of the regions. So the top half of all of our forms are, are, are the same. It's the, the regional data difference is actually the cost breakdown structure that we use uh, in each of those regions. So next slide, slide, please, Richard. So in addition to Excel, we can actually just sit in front of the quickest module and type the data directly into the system. Um, so if we're importing it, this is, this is where we would sit and validate the data. If we're doing it from scratch, this is where you, do, you just type it in. And one of the issues that I'll touch on in terms of future development is obviously we'll have a web form that captures this data um, and go directly into the system. So what, what we've also um, got here as well is where the exclamation mark sits, it's mandatory data. So we have to have that as, as a minimum, otherwise we, we can't move on to the next screen. And as a nod to uh, James and BCS, you'll see that we have the BCS location factors here, which are, form the basis of, of all of the uh, benchmarking that we do in the UK. So moving on to the next slide, you'll see the, uh, the end, uh, so the, the web portal that we've had developed. Um, we've got an entry screen, we have the data screen on the right hand side. So when you go into the screen in the UK, you get a, a, a marker pin that says you're in the UK, you double click on that, it, it goes out and shows you what projects you've got where in the country. Um, the, the reason we've had this uh, built is that we can very quickly, uh, whether we're using a phone, a tablet or a computer, so take the scenario sitting in a client office, you want to, do, you want to show them a, a benchmark report for the type of building they're talking about, you can very quickly do that. Create a PDF which has the um, benchmark report and the data sheets to support how that benchmark has been created as one PDF which we can then email directly to the, to the client. 
and it's something that internally as well we can use we, we can actually automate the uh, publication of the the benchmarking report so we can have those sent out as emails monthly so it, it, it's starting to use the data that we we're capturing in the in the causeway system um, which we can then use in the quickest um, end of it as well to create estimates very quickly using the same information but also supplemented with BCAS um, data um, as James mentioned at the beginning of, of the session um, Causeway does have direct link into, into BCS, so th it is the same with the, uh, the benchmark information as well. Um, so we use CISF CISFB classification in order that we can um, pull that data through as well to enrich ours. Um, so th th this is effectively step to phase one of our journey. Um, it's, uh, it's gone live th this year, um, and it's something that we're, we're looking to integrate into, into the way we, we operate our business. So if we can move to the next slide, please, Richard. So a few lessons that we've learned uh, on, on the way. It's ensuring that data capture is consistent and complete. We, we have to have a mandated minimum response, and that's, that's why we have the exclamation marks uh, on, on that data input um, screen. Key one is to engage with our teams. So you can sit in front of somebody and tell them that they need to fill a spreadsheet in um, until you're blue in the face, they won't necessarily do it. If you can sit with them and show them the outputs that show why they need to do it, you're going to get a far better response than, than if, you, if you don't. What we've also had to do is ensure the system's flexible to allow an agile response to the differing ge geographical re regions. Our colleagues in North America um, do things ever so slightly differently to, re to reflect the market that they operate in, so we've built the system to allow that. So it's the same system but with the data that they need. We've also realised as well, and this, this whole time with what um, Alan's been talking about with the professional statement, it's not just about the cost. We've added data fields for operative numbers, run rates for prelims, etc. They all add value when you're benchmarking projects because you can understand what projects are actually um, closely aligned to each other and where the differences are as well. Um, and one of the key things as well is allow enough time to, to change. Um, you can't just mandate that on a particular date something will happen. You have to make sure it's planned and, and properly executed. So if we can move to the final slide that I've prepared. Where are we going in the future? Um, well, obviously, we're going to uh, take on board the cost prediction statement um, as outlined by Alan. I think there's a lot of good factors in there which we we do look at in our benchmarking and our reporting at the moment. It's, it's just making sure that we have a, a formalization of that in our processes. Um, it, it's, it's looking at all of the metrics um, and uh, understanding what, what they actually, uh, how they affect the, the benchmarking. And then ICMS as well. It, it's, that's, a, that's a good starting point for us to actually start to allow for the global comparison of projects. Um, that's, that's something we've been wrestling with for the for the course of um, 2020, uh, and something that's that's on our roadmap to to get um, sorted out this year. So that that's it for me. I will hand back to to James um, to conclude um, us today. Mark, thank you, thank you very much, and uh, a big thank you, obviously, to to all of the presenters. It's really really good insight uh, coming through there in terms of uh, what we're facing, some of the challenges we're facing and, and how, how, we're, how we're dealing with those. If I can ask the presenters just to, if they're comfortable to, to, to share their, their webcams, um, we'll, um, we'll just go into a bit of a Q&A uh, session for the next sort of five, five minutes. There we go, brilliant. Fantastic, um, Rich. I'm not seeing any questions being being posted, so I'll I'll, I'll just again pr prompt the uh, the the attendees if you can uh, type any questions into the into the chat area. It's possible that I just can't see them at the moment because I'm having techno technology issues. Um, we have but, got a few uh, questions, James. Brilliant. Uh, I can't see where they are, Richard. They're not not oh, appearing in my. Uh, yeah, do you mind? That would be that would yeah. be awesome. Yeah, sorry to ask you to do that. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, I'll just quickly cover because we have had a few questions about recording the session. Um, so just to make you aware, we will make it available for all attendees uh, and it will also circulate on our LinkedIn group. Um, so we, we'll share those shortly. Um, so the first question we've got um, 
is from, apologies, I haven't got the name. Uh, I think it's from John Mace. Uh, your building costs and tender price forecasts. Have you the factors, uh, the Brexit effects, i.e. labour shortages, logistics issues and issues regarding obtaining goods and materials? We have, as far as far as as far as they're, they're known. Um, so obviously, we we regard ourselves as experts in in, in the field, and, and we've taken a view as to what those impacts will be. Thank you, David. Excellent. Okay. Uh, the next question: uh, Why does BCIS TPI forecast vary so much from those published by other consultants? Uh, <laughs> table in GNT's Q1. Uh, TPI reports often an issue. That's a good question. I'm not sure I've got the definitive answer. Um, I think it's difficult to know um, when comparing with other consultants, given that we don't actually know what their methodology is. Um, the other consultants are, are reasonably secretive about uh, about what they what they publish and and uh, and how they derive their numbers. Um, I, we're, we're a bit more open, I think. Um, but yeah, it's, it, I'm assuming that we're not comparing like with like. That would be my answer. Yeah, so I think just just adding to that, obviously, all all forecasts are based on the data that you you have available. Um, our, the BCIS forecasts obviously include input from the from the panel that uh, that David was was referring to in his in, in his presentation earlier. Uh, the BCIS will get a, a a very broad section of 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 data to to sort of base it on. So it's possible that we may be seeing that. Some of those uh, consultancy practices are just uh, dealing with specific sectors um, more more than others. Perhaps um, yeah. we'll take we'll take a look at that. But thank you for the question. Okay. Uh, next is in commercial contracting and estimating. Is it likely that contractors will take a hit on their profit rate uh, to cover some of their risks, uh, as opposed to trying to? Uh, offset transfer to these risks to the client. David, I think you touched upon a bit of that with your with your forecast, your TPI forecast. So if I can ask you to to pick that up, and then perhaps we'll move on to Mark and get your view from the from the contracting side. Yeah, I mean, I think it probably is a, a question more for Mark. Um, yeah, I mean, our view is that uh, the market is going to become increasingly challenging um, for, for contractors. Um, but yeah, it'd be good to hear Mark's view on that. From the coal face. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what, what we've been, what we've been seeing is contractors have been um, adjusting margins um, over the course of 2020. Um, as as Brexit impacts become become known, um, I think there'll probably be a hardening in in that, um, and I think it will depend on what tier contractor we're talking about as well. Um, I, I think there will be those that have a secure order order book. They'll concentrate on that order book, and there will still be those that are, are chasing margin, or sorry, ch ch chasing order books, um, and will be prepared to open open things up. So it very much depends. Thanks, Mark. I think we've got time for one more question, uh, Rich. If there's if there's another one that you can easily call out for us. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, next question, what environmental factor do you allow in your data system to try and achieve a zero rate on the environment? Wow. So yeah, um, uh, it, it's a great question. I'll, I'll, I'll start off, uh, Mark, while that gives you time to, to think in terms of uh, uh, what, what you're doing. Um, uh, at, at BCIS and RICS, we've been uh, encouraging um, over the last few years um, the consideration of environmental impacts um, uh, as well as costs. Um, so the BCIS has a number of uh, sort of data uh, libraries, databases uh, within its system that that actually um, uh, estimate embodied carbon at the same time as costs and life cycle costs, which I think we're going to see progressively over the next few years. Uh, Alan, I'll come to you in a short while because obviously ICMS3 is an important factor here. Um, but uh, the, 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 the more that we're automating uh, some of our takeoffs and, and estimates, I think we'll start to see the environmental uh, factors being being calculated. Alan, can I come to you quickly on ICMS3, please? Yes, thanks, James. Look, as I said in my presentation, there's a lot of money that's flowing into ESG thinking, 
both in property and construction and the construction industry um, accounts for 40 percent of carbon emissions so the decarbonization and the circular economy are key issues in construction uh, what we feel at the rics is that we need to get quantity surveyors more involved with professional toolkits that they can use in practice to uh, provide the right information at the right time to make these key decisions and therefore to extend ICMS as a cost classification into carbon metrication makes absolute sense to us and as I say the third edition of ICMS will incorporate um, carbon metrics and be published later this year and, and since COP26 is coming in, into the UK later this year I think that's a timely reminder that we need um, actual professional toolkits for the professional to use to decarbonize construction in the industry. Thanks Alan. Mark do you have any further thoughts before I wrap the session up? Um, I suppose just, just to sort of um, move, move on from what Alan was saying, I, one of the 2026 um, MACE goals is, is, to, is to achieve um, negative carbon uh, as a business and actually to, to uh, ensure that we're, we're pre preaching that message and helping our clients on that journey as well. So uh, in conjunction with our responsible um, business section, uh, we're we're embarking on that journey with um, we've invested in some software one click allows us to, to do the embodied carbon calculations we're involved in uh, net zero carbon studies and it, it's it's where we all need to be um, and all of that is is factored into into the reporting that we do um, at the moment it's obviously what have you done to to achieve that how much has it costed what certification have we achieved um, but moving forward, it's going to obviously be more front and centre in what we do. That's great. Thank you, Mark. Perhaps a, a future topic there. I think the, the 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 carbon sort of environmental impacts probably warrants its own its own webinar. Okay. Well, conscious we're we're slightly over over time now, so uh, I just want to thank you all for attending. Um, hopefully, the session has has been of of, of interest. Obviously, uh, please complete your your feedback forms, uh, and that will help us shape what we're going to do in the future. Um, my uh, huge thanks to the presenters today, David, Allen, and Mark. Uh, brilliant insight really appreciate that and uh, yeah everybody please stay safe and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next BCIS webinar thank you everybody <laughs>